I would like to invite you all back to your last dinner. The last time you sat down and had a civilised meal. And I do apologise to the parents with young children, you might feel a bit wistful right now. <laughs> and I'd like you to visualise the food that was on your plate and ask yourself, do I really know where this food came from? Which growing region, where were the raw ingredients grown and harvested? Which field, which farm, who was the farmer and what was their story? And how did the food get from there to my plate? The reality is that we've lost touch with our food system. And I'll give you an example. Most people don't realise that our food generates greenhouse gas emissions, which are driving climate change. In fact, our food generates more emissions than all of the world's cars, trucking, shipping, aviation and the entire fashion industry combined. Our food generates more emissions than all the buildings on Earth. I wonder how many of you visualised your plate as a steaming pile of greenhouse gas emissions. Our food is now responsible for 33% of total global greenhouse gas emissions. Yet we only allocate 3% of climate finance on adapting our food system to climate change. So what on earth is going on? Well, through 30 years as an architect specialising in sustainable development and climate resilience, seeking those key levers, the acupuncture points for meaningful climate action, my work and more recently my research have zeroed in on ground zero for climate action, our plates. And I'm here today because I'm really curious about how we as individuals and families might hold the key to changing the shape of our food system entirely. And by food system, I mean all the things that bring food to our plate. And it's currently a linear system. There are all these inputs at the front, like land clearing to make way for crops, seeds, water, fertiliser, pesticides, buildings, equipment, energy and labour, the list goes on. We harvest, wash and prepare this food, we package it, cool it, freeze it, and often ship it long distances to get it to us. And this system is far from perfectly efficient. At every point, there is wastage. Then we come along to buy the food, and we know now that 20 to 25% of that food ends up in landfill where it rots and gives off methane. We all know what methane is. It's a greenhouse gas 80 times worse than carbon dioxide. It's rocket fuel for climate change. Climate change is already reducing agricultural output through soil erosion and salinity, storms, floods, droughts, heat events. The warming climate is allowing pest species to expand their range and is already reducing the nutritional value of some crops. The UN says we only have around 60 harvests left before climate change has completely unravelled our food system. And at the centre of all of this is us and what we choose to put on our plates. So, rather than sit back and let all of this happen, what can we do about changing the shape of our food system? And I'm going to break this down into bite-sized chunks and look at fertilisers and pesticides, food security, food poverty, urban farming, our health and food waste. So let's begin by removing the synthetic fertilisers from our plates. So nitrogen is a key ingredient in agricultural fertilisers and it oxidises into nitrous oxide. Some of you might know that as laughing gas. I just picture farmers rolling around laughing. It's actually a greenhouse gas that's incredibly potent. It's 300 times stronger than carbon dioxide. And alone is now responsible for 4% of total global greenhouse gas emissions. That's about the same as the aviation industry. Russia has always been one of the largest exporters of agricultural nitrogen. But now because of their invasion of Ukraine, 
the global price of fertilisers has gone up, and so, therefore, has the cost of our food. In response, our farmers are already seeking ways to reduce, if not avoid, the use of agricultural nitrogen. And they're starting to make gains, particularly through a, a method called regenerative agriculture. It's producing in partnership with nature, incredibly exciting and hopeful space. So let's say no more synthetic fertilisers on our plates and see what our farmers come up with. Let's also remove the chemical pesticides from our plates. So fumigants are used to kill everything except the plant. And they also release nitrous oxide emissions. Now, removing these from the food system is going to be tough, but there are already innovations popping up around the world. We've just got one locally in Australia. It's a startup called Bardi. You might have heard of them. They're producing a biofertiliser and inoculant using the castings, that's the poop, of black soldier fly larvae. I know what you're trying to visualise right now. <laughs> and now you're trying to visualise, how do they pick it up? It must be so tiny. So food waste is fed to these black soldier fly larvae, which are then processed into high-protein animal feed and nutrient-rich fertiliser. And this fertiliser makes the plants more naturally resistant to pests. How clever is that? So food waste into animal protein and biofertiliser all in the one place maybe even in our cities. Now, like you, I'm not sure if I could live next door to a black soldier fly larvae poop factory, but I'm a big believer in good zoning and good design can solve anything, so let's bring them in. So let's say no to chemical pesticides on our plates and see how that might drive innovation. Let's have a look at food security, particularly in the context of climate change. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if you've bought hot chips lately, weakness, <laughs> the prices have gone up, if you can even get them, due to major floods in our potato-growing regions, hundreds of miles away. Recent floods have even cut off road access to container trucks, leading to more food wastage, higher prices for what we can buy, and even a loss of export earnings. You might recall not long ago, the price of a lettuce got as high as $10. There were shops substituting with cabbage. And that was due to floods and storms on the east coast of Australia, again, hundreds of miles away. There are many, many examples like this over the last decade. Climate change will continue to amplify all of these natural weather events. So by diversifying where we grow our food, might we lessen our reliance on food from afar? So shortening the distance between farm and plate is going to be absolutely critical in the way we adapt our food system to climate change. Let's have a look at a social dimension of our food system, food poverty. And this is part of a much broader topic known as food sovereignty. If you'd like to learn more about that, it's a fascinating space at the moment. Food poverty is the inability to afford or gain access to enough food to make up a healthy and culturally appropriate diet. And only last year, we had one in five Australians experiencing food poverty, including over a million children. There's a wonderful trial going on in Tasmania right now that is working at the heart of solving food poverty. It's called the School Lunch Project and they are putting free meals in front of school children across 15 state primary schools in areas where food poverty is a major problem. These kids are turning up to school with no lunch, no recess, no snacks, no money. Not only does it affect their health, their well-being and their happiness, but it impacts their learning as well. The program has been so successful that they're adding another 15 schools this year. It's a wonderful success story. Sure, there are other lunch programs around the world. The US have been doing it since, I think, 1946. But what's special about this one in Tasmania is the focus on sourcing locally grown, sustainable food. See how we're beginning to join the dots. So how possible is it to grow more of our food closer to our plates? Well, there's a fascinating array of agricultural technologies popping up and emerging around the world. 
from vertical farms in climate-controlled high-rise buildings to basement farms, aquaponics, which is fish and leafy greens. There's poop involved in that one too. Um, rooftop gardens with beehives, insect farms, even pigs. Apparently pigs on roofs are the, are the apex of urban farming. <laughs> we have some way to go there. <laughs> Recent research out of the US has discovered now a direct correlation between how far people must go to access fresh food and their health. So the closer the fresh food is to where they live, the lower the rates of overweight and obesity, diabetes and even heart disease. We've even discovered that the act of us coming together to grow food, it doesn't matter what we're growing, builds community resilience. We get better at looking after each other through the act of growing food. Particularly during disaster events like storms, floods and bushfires. So for me, the method that still has so much potential and value is the urban farm or the community garden. 80 years ago in World War II, we had victory gardens, you might have heard that. We were encouraged to grow our own food to support the war effort. And by the end of the war, the US alone had 20 million victory gardens, growing 40% of the nation's fresh produce. Grown by families in backyards and front yards and streets and parks. Dig for victory was the slogan. Well, now we need to dig for climate, and it's just as urgent. Imagine a food system that has this incredible mix of food-growing methods in and around our cities, employing a new generation of urban farmers growing food that's sustainable and healthy next to our plates, in balance with nature, not reliant on inputs from afar. We have barely begun to fill the gaps in our food system by filling the gaps in our cities and reshaping our food system to grow more food close to our plates is entirely possible. So before we have dessert, we have one major dish that we have to digest. At the federal level, we're told that we need to boost agricultural productivity by 28% over the next decade to achieve our zero hunger goal. I'm just I'm not convinced of the wisdom of expanding a system that is already not working for us and is definitely not working for the planet. Our challenge is not just how and where we grow our food, but how much we waste. Food wastage in Australia is equivalent to around one in five bags of groceries per year. It's over $2,000 worth of groceries per household per year just thrown in the bin. It's not even given to people who are hungry. The land required to grow this wasted food is larger than the state of Victoria. Now, don't get me wrong, no judgement. We're all part of this system. It is incredibly difficult to avoid food waste. But it's not waste if it feeds something else, just like in nature. Chickens, worms, microbes and mushrooms, composting machines, Pigs on roofs, black soldier fly larvae. There we go. Imagine if we set ourselves the goal of zero food waste. Not just from our plates and our pantries, but from our entire food system. By returning all of that organic compost, in other words, organic fertiliser, back to the growing cycle, we've got the final link required to enable a circular food system, a system that is vastly more efficient. It's more secure against climate shocks. It's more sustainable and in balance with nature. It's healthier, it's fairer, maybe even abundant. An ecosystem of nutrients and dollars circulating locally, imagine that. All of nature's systems are circular, why not our food system? So, it's time for dessert. I'm feeling quite full. We've had quite the smorgasbord of ideas. It's probably a lot to digest. So if you have only one takeaway, <laughs> should have played bingo, make it this. You 
have the power on your plates to move our food system from a linear catastrophe to a circular power for climate action by supporting local growers and producers. Local growers and producers. So many good things can flow from this. Three times a day, you have a reminder of what shape our food system needs to be. And three times a day, you get to vote on what kind of future you want. I feel incredibly privileged to be able to share this idea with you today. So thank you for listening, and please, please enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you.